Carbon dioxide emissions are expected to return to pre-pandemic highs this year. Last year, they fell significantly during the Great Lockdown. In China, they bounced back and grew overall due to coal. The crisis has only given climate change respite. An unprecedented consumption boom is fueling the global economy. And people are driving more to avoid getting infected on public transport. Then there's the pandemic's most visible legacy, plastic waste. Hi, I'm Ben Fazulan. Millions of people around the world have taken to wearing masks to protect themselves, but they're hurting the environment. We'll talk about that and the pandemic's carbon footprint in a moment with Sir Dieter Helm. First, this report. The Silco Islands, at the far southwest of the territory comprising Hong Kong. The waters here have long been polluted, but with the pandemic, a new form of waste has turned up, masks. And now we have this to contend with. We have the coronavirus and all these masks are now washing up on the beaches. These images make me start to wonder, how much of a hazard are these masks for our planet? It's an item that many of us now wear every day. And why do so many of them end up in the ocean instead of being disposed of through the normal channels? And what's the right way to dispose of a mask anyway? Whether it's the higher grade respirator masks or the more basic surgical ones or rubber gloves that people are also using now, they all belong in the trash and aren't suitable for recycling. Because they're medical waste, they've been used, so they need to be incinerated. At some stage, you end up with microplastic. That's what makes the masks bad for the environment. Along the coast of Hong Kong, scientists are finding a growing number of them. They estimate that around 1.5 billion masks entered the sea last year. Um, we need to reduce the single use, number one. Um, but then also it comes down to governments and uh, you know, how they handle their waste management facilities. Because like here, the, the garbage bins, the rubbish bins in the street, um, they have very wide openings on the top and people just put their masks in thinking they're doing the right thing and they get blown out very easily. And as soon as they're out and they're on the street, they go down the drains, they go down the drains and all the drains lead to the ocean. It looks like masks won't be disappearing from our lives anytime soon. There are already far too many in the sea. For more, let's ask Dieter Helm, a professor of economic policy at Oxford University in the UK. He's the author of numerous books and was recently knighted for his services to the environment and energy policy. So Dieter, we've seen all those used masks and test kits lying around. Plastic waste is one obvious environmental impact of this pandemic. What are others? Well, you're absolutely right that uh, uh, plastic waste is is gone up uh, quite considerably. And we have to recall that one of the uh, great drivers of future oil demand is plastics. Uh, and it just shows how hard it is to tackle that. But um, lots of other impacts. I suspect the one that's going to be the biggest is the impact of all the uh, fiscal and monetary stimuluses and the extra demand that that creates around the world. Uh, and that, I think, will be the lasting legacy of the economic shock of uh, coronavirus. And the environment will be uh, having impacts as a consequence of that uh, economic shock. Is there any way around that? I mean, economists are always telling us to uh, buy more, to keep our economies going, to create jobs. Uh, do we or should we hold off? Well, uh, you know, some consumption is perfectly consistent with a sustainable economy and some isn't. And uh, the idea that the objective should be just to boost GDP, which is a very crude measure of well-being, uh, is one that jars very badly with some of that 
unsustainable consumption, which we should be focused on, not just in the carbon context, but also, of course, in the biodiversity world. You wrote in May 2020, the most important lesson from the virus so far is that pollution and GDP are still correlated, not decoupled. Do you see changes here? Well, actually, um, in a way, I was too optimistic with that statement. Um, it turns out that higher GDP and higher environmental impacts uh, have been going together, and they're particularly uh, carbon. But what we witnessed during the coronavirus was a sharp contraction of GDP, but without an environmental bonus. So although it's true, for example, that carbon emissions went down quite a lot during the lockdowns, we still added two parts per million uh, to the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, as we had done for the previous 30 years. And so what we've learned, I think, is that even if you contract uh, uh, demand in the short term, GDP in the short term, that isn't enough to halt these fundamental adverse trends in the way in which our natural environment and our climate are going. Talking about the climate and our natural environment, this climate crisis is intertwined with biodiversity loss and the, the spread of zoonotic diseases uh, are also intertwined. Do you think people really understand that link? Uh, I doubt very much whether all the uh, focus on uh, getting carbon emissions down has fully understood that carbon emissions are only half the uh, climate change problem and have to be set in a wider environmental context. You know, the natural environment soaks up carbon and we and the natural environment emit carbon. Sequestration is 50% or more of the climate change problem. And you just have to look at what's going on agriculture and the soils and so on to see that. And it turns out that that sequestration part is where the interaction comes with biodiversity and biodiversity loss. Take this startling fact that the Amazon is now a net emitter of carbon. That huge biodiversity bank uh, uh, hotspot in our world is not only now shedding uh, its biodiversity as it's uh, um, uh, burnt, but also are now contributing to climate change. That should be a major wake-up call. And it's the sort of thing which requires at least as much focus as the obvious things like, for example, getting out of coal. So what do you think will change people's mind or change behaviours? Because you say the Amazon should be a wake-up call. You'd think COVID-19 would also be a wake-up call, but uh, we, we see it, COP26, the, the same old problems. Yes, I, I think COP26, like the previous 25, has made no significant difference to adding two parts per million per annum, as we have done for the last 30 years, to the atmosphere. Um, but I think when people talk about behavioural change, they have to get in mind two distinct things. There are some people who think that we can change human nature the way we are, and my take is that evolution has brought us to where we are and human nature is roughly the same uh, tomorrow as it was yesterday. And in most places, uh, it remains pretty constant. What we can change is the incentives on us and those incentives so that we make different choices given our human nature. And that's about carbon taxes, carbon pricing, making polluters pay, integrating the environment into the economy. And uh, it's sad to say that at COP26, there was virtually no discussion about serious carbon pricing, about carbon border pricing, about carbon consumption pricing. These are the things confronting you and me as the ultimate polluters with the costs and consequences of our actions. That's what changes behavior, not some appeal to, you know, People have changed their nature going forward because of their experience of the coronavirus. Sadly not. There's no evidence whatsoever of that. Sudita Helm from Oxford University in the UK, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. And a viewer question now for our science correspondent Derek Williams on the recycling of masks. Can boiling used masks in water clean them of pathogens? 
Like other kinds of personal protective equipment, um, masks were in really short supply pretty much everywhere for months after the pandemic first hit. Um, lots of people just made their own, and the right ways to keep a multi-use mask clean were a big issue. Uh, manufacturers have now ramped up production of disposable masks to the point where at least by German standards, um, they're plentiful and cheap, but I'm sure they're neither in many other places. So here's what the World Health Organization has to say on cleaning used masks. Multi-use fabric masks should be washed at least once a day in soap or detergent and water that's heated to at least 60 degrees Celsius. If that isn't possible, then you can also wash the masks in room temperature water first, then place them in boiling water for one minute to get rid of potential pathogens. Uh, but what about washing or boiling single-use masks? Well, I found a few studies looking at whether they can also be decontaminated for further use, and the researchers came to the conclusion that when certain cleaning procedures were followed correctly, high-quality commercial masks remained an effective barrier even after washing. Um, however, both the CDC and the WHO continue to warn that disposable masks should not be washed or reused, but instead thrown away after one use. So the experts there clearly are not yet convinced that it's a good idea. You heard it from Derek. Nice to have you along. Stay safe and see you again soon.